Maybe you've heard someone jokingly say, if you can't be good, be good at. Well, that would mean that if you can't seem to help being a liar or a thief or some other kind of sinner, at least make sure that you don't get caught. Kind of funny, but not really serious advice. Even if you could be good enough at it to not get caught in this life, eventually we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Well, if that sounds like the beginning of a hellfire and brimstone sermon, uh, it really isn't. The truth is we can all be good and we can at least become better at being good. So let's briefly review what we saw in Paul's letter to Titus uh, in the last lesson. Paul told Titus, as for you, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. And we asked the question, what is sound doctrine? Well, the answer the whole letter stresses is summarized in chapter three. Those who trust God should devote themselves to doing what is good. So then we asked, well, then what is unsound doctrine? And we saw the list of things that we don't want in our leaders, such as being overbearing, quick tempered, given to drunkenness, violent, dishonesty, rebelliousness, deceptiveness, uh, disobedience, self-indulgence, enviousness, hatefulness, argumentativeness, quarrelsomeness, condemning, uh, having a condemning spirit. And we saw that while it is true that any teaching is doctrine and any true teaching is sound, the Bible only uses the term in this one way, and that is to live good lives. So now Paul goes on with a list of instructions which serve to remind us that no matter what our station in life, we can do what is good. We can be good and be good at it. In fact, Paul continues and lays out specific ways to devote ourselves to doing good. Uh, and he applies this to various groups of people in the culture that Titus was in on Crete. And he basically covers everyone in the process. All of us can be devoted to doing good. All of us can be good and be good at it. So he starts with older men and he will get to older women. I found this description of a typical day for either gender as we get older. Recently, I was diagnosed with AAADD, Age Activated Attention Deficit Disorder. This is how it manifests itself. I decide to water my garden. As I turn on the hose in the driveway, I look over at my car and decide my car needs washing. As I start toward the garage, I notice there's mail on the porch table that I brought up from the mailbox earlier. I decide to go through the mail before I wash the car. I lay my keys down on the table, put the junk mail in the trash can under the table, and notice that the trash can is full. So I decide to put the bills back on the table and take out the trash first. But then I think, since I'm going to be near the mailbox when I take out the garbage anyway, I might as well pay the bills first. I take my checkbook off the table and I see that there's only one check left. My extra checks are in my desk in the study, so I go inside the house to my desk where I find the can of Coke that I had been drinking. I'm going to look for my checks, but first I need to push the Coke aside so that I don't actually knock it over. I see that the Coke is getting warm and I decide I should put it in the refrigerator to keep it cold. As I head uh, toward the kitchen with the Coke, a vase of flowers on the counter catches my eye. They need to be watered. So I <laughs> place the coat down on the work service. I discover my reading glasses that I've been searching for all morning. I decide that I put, better put them back on my desk, but first I'm going to water the flowers. I set the glasses back down on the worktop, fill a container with water, and suddenly I spot the TV remote. Someone has left it on the kitchen table. I realize that Tonight, when we go to watch TV, I'll be looking for the remote, but I won't remember that it's on the kitchen table, so I decide to put it back in the lounge where it belongs, but first, I'll water the flowers. I pour some water in the flowers, but quite a bit of it spills on the floor. So I set the remote back down on the table, get some towels, and wipe up the spill. Then I head down the hall trying to remember what I was planning to do. At the end of the day, the car isn't washed, the bills aren't paid, 
There's a warm can of Coke sitting on the work surface. The flowers don't have enough water. There's still only one check in my checkbook. I can't find the TV remote. I can't find my glasses. And I don't remember what I did with the car keys. Then when I try to figure out why nothing got done today, I'm really baffled because I know I was busy all day long and I'm really tired. I realize this is a serious problem and I'll try to get some help for it. But first, I'll check my email. P.S. I just remembered I left the water running. So it's no wonder why we might get a little grumpy as we get a little older. But seriously, what is being good if you're an older man? Paul puts it this way, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. So that does not sound like we should let ourselves become grumpy old men. Uh, Paul first uses three words that have, three, have different shades of meaning, but the same central meaning. Temperate can be defined as self-control, uh, and self-controlled can be defined as temperate. Uh, the phrase worthy respect, as it is translated in the NIV, is one Greek word, which might be better translated dignified. A temperate, self-controlled man is never undignified in the way he acts. He handles things well. He is mature. Back when I was in college, uh, there was a man who was a really good man, but he undermined the influence for good that he could have had because he just would lose control of himself on the tennis court. And when he did, I wouldn't describe him as being dignified. Everyone knew that he was a Bible professor at Harding. Now we need for our older men to be in control. We need them to be people that we can rely on. Paul goes on to add that formula that we know so well from 1 Corinthians 13. The one that you see on uh, the wall hangings beside our, our pulpit up front. The older men need to be sound in faith, love, and endurance. Now endurance is inspired by hope, as Paul said in Colossians. So we have faith, hope, and love as is on those wall hangings. Uh, leave any one of those out and you have an imbalance. Faith and love without endurance will result in real disillusionment when this good, hardworking, lovable, and loving man gives up one day because there's no endurance. Faith and endurance without love will result in self-righteous, uh, you know, self-righteousness and, and he may become a hurtful loudmouth. Uh, I don't think endurance and love are even possible without faith since they have to be based on something. So what we need from our men is stability, people who can be looked up to. This doesn't mean that they all must be leaders or teachers as we normally understand those terms, but that's about all that should separate Christian men as a whole from Christian men who should serve in those ways. We men need to devote ourselves to faith, hope, and love. Now there are instructions for older ladies as well. What is being good if you're an older woman? Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. So we don't want to be grumpy old women either, right? Being reverent in the way you live doesn't have to do with how you act during church, though you ought to be reverent there. Uh, Paul is really calling for much more than that. He's suggesting that people who know you should know your life is given to God because of the way that you act and live. Uh, if you're upset when the flower arrangement you order doesn't turn out right, for example, uh, and it becomes apparent to those involved, that you are so upset, then it's also apparent to them that you're no different from the world. You're concerned about the same things. The same things upset you. So that's what you live for. Your life is set apart for God, not for your own purposes. Uh, your life is set apart for God to use as he sees fit. And if you understand that, you should grow to accept that as the years go by. Now the reason for the instructions about wine has to do with the Cretan culture uh, in a large part. There was lots of drunkenness. Uh, the Cretans were known to be lazy. And what do lazy people do with their time? Well, if that is a problem, if drinking is a problem, it does need to be overcome. 
Now, I don't think that our older ladies are particularly prone to that as Cretan women were, but the instructions regarding slandering might be some that we need to think about. Uh, I must say that I believe that we have some really sweet ladies here, but we've all known some older ladies who seem to get more critical and more bitter as they age. Now maybe it's the result of jealousy. Maybe they can't be a part of the scandals anymore so they decide that their role is to punish those who are. Uh, so they do it with their tongues. Well, I, I'm joking, but I do think that we have to take Paul seriously as he warns older women in particular about these temptations. Christian women become more important as they grow older. You are needed by the younger women. You shouldn't have time to sit around and grow bitter or to drink and gossip. Uh, well, what is being good if you're a younger woman? Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the church, the word of God. Now, while society today is teaching young women to put themselves first, Paul tells them to put their children and husbands first. That's just what love is. Well, self-control, purity, kindness, these are qualities that are actually ridiculed among today's young people. And many of every age uh, who are particularly, uh, or who are politically active, uh, tend to ridicule some of these kinds of qualities, self-control and purity and kindness. But they're, they're so basic to the personality of Christ. The object of many female comedians uh, these days, for example, is to see whether they can be as crude and indecent as men have been uh, too often in, you know, in the past and present. So as the role of women uh, as for the role of women as portrayed here, I think that we miss the real emphasis because Paul has been called a male chauvinist because of this passage and a couple of others. And on the one hand, Paul does affirm that wives and mothers have responsibilities to their families. But the real emphasis is that Cretan society believes that. And if Christians live below the standard of that society, then God's re reputation will suffer. Well, the problem in the first century was that when Christians learned that every one of them was to be submissive to every other, the men submissive to the women as well as the women submissive to the men, then the women were all of a sudden raised to a status of equality and value. Well, the pagans didn't really believe that. Women were property. Well, the truth couldn't be denied by the Christians. I mean, women were equal. But just because women were equal in value to men didn't mean that they had to fill the same roles. So in the first century, it was the Christian women who needed to understand this. The pagan women would never have been allowed to even bring up the question. And so Paul goes uh, with common sense. You don't make waves unless you have to in order to defend truth. It is not a sin for women to be wonderful mothers and wives and homemakers. And that was the only thing they had the opportunity to do in the Cretan culture. So if that's the role that you find yourself in, then be good at it. And that applies today. Yes, you have the freedom and principle to do anything that a man does as an occupation or career. But how does it make you a lesser person to love your husband and children? To be self-controlled and pure kind, busy at home, and even to do your best to meet the needs of your husband. Well, that's what it means to be subject to another person. As for the young men, their most common problem is self-control, not at all unlike the older men. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by, what, by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, I suppose the only difference between the younger men and older men on the issue of self-control might be that it's almost expected of younger men to have issues with self-control. You know, that's why Titus, a young man himself, is set up as an example for them. If he can control his temper, though he is young, 
then so can the others. Following the same principle, Titus is to be their example in every area. Young men had the energy to be the driving force of the church family, but they will only end up destroying it if they aren't self-controlled and serious, or if they have uh, questionable integrity and are not sound in their speech. Well, what is said about slaves doesn't in any way indicate that slavery is right, but it does indicate that it is not wrong to be a slave. He says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Now, a slave does not have to put himself or herself in danger by rebelling against the institution. That's why uh, that was not advocated for slaves because it would put themselves in danger. And as long as he or she is a slave, then their job remains to meet the needs of their masters. It's their job. Being subject to someone does not mean that you are inferior to them or less important than they are. It just means that that's your job. So do it well. So although none of us are slaves, legally anyway, uh, it does say a lot to us about our attitudes as employees. Be subject to your boss. Try to please him or her. Don't talk back to your boss. Don't argue. Don't steal from your boss. Take Taking work breaks that aren't coming to you is stealing. Padding the expense account is stealing. Showing that you show that you can be fully trusted. The reason for all of this is the important thing. So that in every way you will make the teaching about God, our Savior, more attractive. Okay, so whether you're a man or a woman, old or young, independently wealthy or a slave, you can and must do what is good. That is sound doctrine. Now verses 11 through 14 give us the rationale. Why should we bother with all of this and what will it prove if we do? For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Now, is this what we teach? Is this our idea of sound doctrine? Well, Paul isn't quite finished. He goes on to add something for all of us. He says, no, no matter how bad the government is, it is right and good to be subject to it. No matter where you live, you can do what is good. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and always to be gentle toward everyone. My favorite founding father who was involved in the Revolutionary War uh, and the development of our great country was Benjamin Franklin. Now he was far from perfect, but he was very creative and quotable for sure. Well, the phrase that he proposed for the great seal of the United States may not have been his own creation and it was actually used, uh, it was not actually used on the great seal but Thomas Jefferson did use it on his own seal. The line is, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. This is Thomas Jefferson's seal. I think we all want to believe that, but it just doesn't seem quite consistent with sound doctrine as Paul described it to Titus. Now, King George claimed to be a Christian, the one that they rebelled against, in the Revolutionary War, and virtually all of the colonists claim to be Christians. So it's a little different than the relationship of the Christians on Crete with their pagan rulers. 
Now, I'm not sure, though, whether that puts our forefathers in a better or worse position on this issue. But I do believe that in the here and now, we need to obey every law that we can unless it is clearly not something that Jesus would have obeyed. That's the test. Sometimes it's not perfectly clear, but that is always what we must try to do. Well, why? Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. And similarly, the young men should do all of these things that young men should do that's good so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. And as to the slaves, they can do all of these things, they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Now, the people of Crete weren't any more content with Roman rule over them than the Jews were content with Roman rule over them. And the Romans were the ones that uh, they appointed to govern their regions and islands. Uh, and they weren't helping the situation, or the ones who they did appoint were not helping the situation. So add to that their attitude toward Christians. Uh, the, the attitude of the Romans and the Roman rulers. And it would seem that there would have been good reasons to justify the government completely because they were tyrants. They were. Well, what should our brothers and sisters in Christ do in India and Taiwan and communist China and Nigeria and Afghanistan and Iran and other places uh, where they are being persecuted? They are living under tyrannical governments. Paul is saying that they should still be obedient unless they are told to sin and they should be ready to do whatever is good. Now, Christians are to influence governments when they can, but not necessarily overthrow them. In some cases, maybe they should, or they should be a part of that. But what should we do? Our government is gradually taking away religious freedom. It's making us pay for abortions. It's making us pay for fighting and killing. Our taxes seem oppressive, and those tax revenues pay for all of these things that we don't believe in. So let's join the tax revolt and refuse to pay. Or let's just quietly cheat on our taxes and pay less. Well, not only that, some laws are ridiculous. Let's just ignore those. What about all of the innocent rules, or inconsistent <laughs> rules, I'm sorry, regarding masks and vaccines and whether or how we can meet to do business or even to worship. We're subject only to God anyway, and so should we openly define uh, or defy those rules? Well, I don't know in every case, but you know what, neither do you. But our first question should always be, what is good? Those who oppose us will not necessarily agree with God's answers and our response to God's answers, but we still will do what is good. Listen to what Paul told Titus. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So doing what is good is clearly the goal, clearly the goal. but Paul is saying that there's another very important question. How will what we do affect people's impressions of Christians. What should stand out about the way that Christians lie, live as compared to how everyone else lives? 
Well, when we look at what Paul said about Cretans, then it might seem easier to stand out as good people, right? Because remember, Paul said one of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Well, even though it might seem like Cretans wouldn't even agree with Christians on what is good, then that probably is not, uh, I mean, even though they might, that probably is not the reality. Some moral issues were certainly twisted in their culture, but it is human nature to say one thing and do, do another. I mean, I feel very certain that few people on Crete would have said that lying and brutality and laziness and gluttony were virtues. And those who lived that way were living good lives. They were almost certainly critical of others who lived that way. But when it came to themselves, then they were likely inclined to say it was justified because everyone else was doing it, right? That's the way it works. And they probably would have said that they weren't as bad as everyone else. Maybe you remember a study of convicts that I mentioned once before. The study published in the British Journal of Social Psychology was based on a survey of 79 convicted, convicted felons serving time in a prison in the south of England. Each prisoner filled out a questionnaire in which they were asked to rate on a five-point scale how they compared to the average prisoner on a series of positive characteristics. Moral, kind to others, trustworthy, honest, dependable, compassionate, generous, law-abiding, and self-controlled. They then filled out a second survey in which they rated how they compared to the average member of the community on all of the above characteristics. Here's the result. Participants rated themselves as better than the average prisoner and even better than the average community member on all traits, with the exception of law abidingness when it came to the community members. On that last point, the researchers report that they rated themselves as equally law-abiding as the average community uh, member. Well, this aspect of human nature only magnifies the importance of living truly good lives. People are inclined to justify their own wrong actions by comparing themselves to others. And that is why they seem so eager to point to anything they can possibly use against Christians. The fact that they will do that no matter what we do makes it even more important to make sure that their criticisms are unfair and, un and completely wrong. See, many of them will never admit it, but many will know the truth in their hearts and may someday come and ask us how we do it. How do you seem so happy even when things aren't going right? How do you handle criticism when it's so unfair? How, uh, have you... Uh, how are you always kind to people who are so unkind to you? How do you not talk back to the boss when he's such a jerk? How do you pay your taxes when you know the government is so wasteful and sometimes seems to oppose what you believe is right and good? See, these are the kinds of questions that our lives should raise in the minds of others. And the answer is what Paul gave in verses 5 through 7. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on, on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. See, I do not recommend directly quoting a passage like this to someone who has little or no knowledge of the Bible or of the Christian faith. Uh, you have to start simpler by saying something honest and straightforward. You know, like, well, it's not always easy to be kind and have a good attitude about these things, but I try to follow the example of Jesus. And I believe that he gave me his own spirit to live in me and help me have the same attitude he had. I still sometimes struggle against his spirit, but I do believe that what God wants is more powerful than what I want and that he will always win in the end. And maybe you can't say it in those exact words, just... Come up with something like that that is your that are your own words and it's natural and sounds normal to them and not kind of weird. I kind of feel like most Christians in the past agreed that we should at least try to live good lives and treat others with kindness and respect. 
But I do see a certain track that some are on that can be very harsh and judgmental and even seems to promote the idea that dedication to Christ requires a lack of compassion toward those who have been deceived by the enemy of all of us. But when it comes to sins involving sexuality, especially those who have been deceived deserve nothing but disgust and even hatred. I just don't see any exceptions though when Paul says be peaceable and considerate and always be gentle toward everyone. Now back to the last specific instructions of Paul to Titus in verses 9 and 10. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. Now that may not seem very gentle, but that's only because we envision this being done in the middle of a fight. Just remember that it takes more than one party to have an ugly fight. If we follow Jesus' example, as Peter tells us we should when we are abused, then we don't fight back. We don't threaten and accuse. Now that means that when someone is being divisive and wanting to engage us in a fight, we just don't engage. We do as gently as possible warn them that what they're doing is divisive and that they need to stop doing it. Uh, and if they do stop, then we don't treat them like a second class member of the church family. They are simply flawed individuals just like us who need to be made aware of what we're doing from time to time. If they refuse, however, and continue divisive activities, then trying to argue and maybe even secretly trying to get followers, you know, we still calmly and lovingly let them know that you can't be a part of their activities. You know, I would say that usually that would mean that you will not be a part of a public debate or argument. You simply don't engage. Now, in addition to the disturbance a divisive person may be causing within the church family, ugly fights among Christians are probably the most damaging testimony possible when it comes to outsiders. Sometimes we treat each other with less gentleness and respect than we treat those outside the church family. It's a strange phenomenon, but it is so common that the word phenomenon almost doesn't seem to apply. Because when Christians disagree, they seem to be the most harsh with the ones whose beliefs and practices are closest to their own. To outsiders, we seem to believe the same things and do the same things, but they might see or hear us arguing that we are the only true followers of Jesus because of some disagreement that they really can't understand at all. We can and we must talk about our differences because some of them are very important. But if we are harsh and judgmental, and act like we know whether a certain understanding of religious truths and practices means that someone is not really a Christian at all, how does that look to outsiders? More importantly, what makes us think that we have the ability and the duty to say that God can forgive our own false ideas, we all have them, but he cannot forgive theirs. As Paul said, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us, on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. None of us has hope except through the grace of God. So there's no place for a hard-nosed, accusing, contentious, argumentative spirit as we discuss God's will either between us or with anyone else. We must learn to show true humility toward all men. We are not to act humble, we are to be humble. And that is not only when we respect someone, that is the way we are to be with anyone. So here are our takeaways. No matter who you are, young or old, slave or free, you're the right person to do what is good. No matter where you live, whether you're in a communist country, whether you're under an oppressive government, whether you're in a free country with freedom of religion, no matter where you live, you're in the right place to do what is good. 
And no matter who you live with, you're the right people to do what is good. So devote yourself to doing good. On the encouraging side, I really don't think that we like to argue about the truth as much anymore. But we do want to, but do we want to live according to the truth? Well, maybe that just seems too hard sometimes. But that's sound doctrine. And we have been given the generous gift of Jesus' Spirit to help us to live according to sound doctrine. If you're going to take communion, then prepare to take the bread at this time, and let's pray. Our Father, as we take this bread that represents Jesus' body, help us to remember the way that he lived and to dedicate ourselves to living by his spirit and being willing to give our lives, our bodies, as sacrifices to others. Uh, we pray, Father, as we take this bread, we will honor Jesus' sacrifice in that way. In his name we pray, amen. And take the, the cup. Our Father, we also recognize that without Jesus' spirit, we could never do what is good consistently. And even if we could do what is good, we would rarely be doing it for a pure reason. But Father, we know that because of his spirit, we can do what is good. And as we take this cup, we are reminded that he shed his blood and his life was in that blood, that he gave up his spirit and he put it into your hands. You returned it to him and you have in turn given it to us. We pray, Father, that we will become more consistent in allowing his spirit to overrule our own as we pray in Jesus' name. So have a good week, again, doing what is good.